well, we'll go ahead and let, let's get started. Thanks, all of you, for joining. I'm Charlie Precord, and uh, we have uh, several members of the board and the safety committee here with us today to introduce and or reinforce some of the programs that have made us so successful. I'm going to hand it off to Blake Kerr, our chairman, uh, to welcome everybody and kick this off. So, Blake, over to you. Thanks, Charlie, and thanks for all of you uh, jumping online with us for our first uh, webinar for the year. This one's chocked full of great information. Some of it you will have already heard, so it'll be great repetition. As I've often been told by my wife, the key to adult learning is repetition. So we'll drive some of that uh, deeper into your memory data banks today, I hope. Um, for those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet yet, I look forward to being able to say hello and press the flesh at another regional event this year. And if not then, then I hope we get to see you in Colorado Springs. Uh, I wanted to give a big thanks to the people that have helped put this program together. We had a chance to run through it last week, and it's just uh, great, great quality of work. Liz, thank you for coordinating it and putting it all together. And uh, Randy, um, for being here, uh, Kirk, Nick, and uh, of course, uh, Jonathan Bailey, really going to wrap us up with Safe to Land. And uh, Charlie, thanks for being our leader and our spirit guide on this uh, journey through this thing called aviation safety. It's just uh, continues to be a treat to be able to work with you so closely. And I just feel we are so blessed as an organization to have you willing to contribute your time, talent, and treasure uh, to the endeavors that our members find important. Um, I really uh, am excited to introduce to those of you that haven't had a chance yet to meet our new boss, uh, Rob Balzano. Uh, he's going to spend more time a little bit talking about himself, but um, CJP, I think, is in great hands. Uh, Rob has a distinguished career in aviation already, and uh, we believe that, that this will be an additional piece of that. And he has already made a significant impact to the Citation Jet Pilot organization, and I just couldn't be more thrilled than having made his acquaintance over the last six months and then getting to the point where we could invite him to be our new CEO and to help us continue to push the envelope. I, if those of you uh, remember when we were at our convention, I said that we were looking for the next leader to help us stand on the shoulders of those that had gone before us to continue to push CJP in an ever increasing and brighter direction. And I, I sure feel confident as does the board that we've found the right guy in Rob. So without uh, delaying any further and realizing we've got a limited amount of time and even smaller amount of bandwidth available to us this afternoon, I, I wanna get into the content, but Rob, uh, thanks for being with us and thanks for participating tonight. I'll give you the reins for a bit, your controls. Yeah. Thank you, I have the aircraft. Thank you, Blake uh, and Charlie and to all our board members, to all our members here. Uh, appreciate the kind words. Uh, I am super excited to be here. It's been about five weeks now in the seat uh, and I am uh, in, Cannot be more thrilled with meeting everybody on these calls. I was just in the Deer Valley, the, in Deer Valley the last uh, last week, and so got a great opportunity to meet some of our key partners and some of the members that were there, all the members that were there. And the scenery wasn't bad either with the snow. Just a fabulous, fabulous uh, event. So um, again, I am very eager to meet all of you. Um, I hope to meet you on a Zoom call at, as a minimum, on a uh, on a voice call, and then hopefully in person at our annual event or anywhere, anytime we have the opportunity. So super excited in the direction that we're headed. I know there's a lot of great things ahead, a lot of a lot of work uh, that is gonna go into it. And, uh, and we can't have a finer, there cannot be a finer team, especially for safety as the ones that we've assembled here. So with that, thank you all. So um, as is shown on the screen here, folks, uh, our goal is to introduce the, the, the programs that we think have been contributing to the great safety record that we've compiled and uh, to give you some information how you can implement them. Uh, we've got three uh, that are most important to share because they require um, some background information to in order for you to, to participate. Uh, Nick and Kirk will help us through the FOCA program. Uh, Randy will talk about gold safety and Jonathan will cover the Safe to Land program. Um, the folks that registered, there's about 50 of us here, uh, a nice spread of the different models. Um, there are about a third of you that are already on one or more of these programs. You can see that that split there. Um, one third on the FOCA, 13 out of 50 on a gold standard, safe to land. And 23 of you have been to the convention. So that means that you have um, heard some of this stuff in the past. The idea here is for those of you that either are aware but not into the details, we'll be able to give you some of the, 
the better reasons why you should consider participating and, and also more importantly, how you can participate. Um, so as we get into this, um, I wanted to share something that we put up at the convention. There's 1,400 members, 900 aircraft in our membership. And we have an amazing three and a half years now with an, in, an accident-free record for in-flight events. There's been uh, four ground incidents since the convention, uh, most notably Unfortunately, the Hawker that collided on the ground during landing, um, the Hawker took off without permission. For those of you who might not be familiar, they were operating at Houston on, on intersecting simultaneous operation, uh, intersecting runways. Mustang was cleared to land going through the intersection. A Hawker who took off without clearance clipped his wingtip through the tail of the Mustang. So lucky. Uh, that it uh, could have been um, total fatalities in both airplanes, but uh, uh, that that uh, turned out uh, in our favor. There was a, a a gouge in the tail of the Mustang and the wingtip of the Hawker. Uh, there's going to be a lot more to come out of that, but um, suffice it to say, in spite of our involvement in that, which obviously wasn't the fault of the Mustang driver, we've had a great three and a half years. And we try to figure out what are the contributors to that um, since early in, in back to the inception of the of our association. You can see we've had private member forums where a lot of you get to speak about different uh, aspects of your flying, sharing lessons learned, and so forth. We we started in seventeen with the safety uh, committee and put up some web pages that give good information. And we had our stand down uh, at the convention beginning in eighteen. But today I want to cover these three programs, uh, the FOCAL program, the Safe to Land program, and the Gold Standard program. They, they have um, made a big contribution. Um, there's less than 100 of us, though, in each of these right now. And so today's uh, intent here today is to, to get those rolling um, and more aware within our membership so more of you can participate. So I'm going to uh, introduce Nick Plantin here for the FOCAL program. Nick uh, has been part of our safety committee involved in developing the FOCA uh, program that we have, Flight Operations Quality Assurance is an airline term, <clears throat> but it's it's more readily known as flight data monitoring and analysis. So Nick, let me turn it over to you and you can say a few words about this. Sure, happy to. Can you hear me? First question. Yeah, sure can. Oh, good. Okay, well, um, so I've been in the program for a bit over a year, as I recall. Um, and, um, you know, I didn't know what uh, FOCWA stood for initially. Um, and, um, you know, it's been really helpful for me, and I'm so glad I did it. And, you know, really, the try to list here the benefits. But firstly, um, you know, for me as a pilot and a relatively inexperienced jet pilot, um, and having done this a couple of years, you know, the feedback has been really helpful. Uh, as you know, you get uh, immediate feedback from from Cloud Ahoy, and mostly this is not something that was, uh, you know, lethally dangerous, but ways to you know, increase one's, um, uh, you know, one's skills and to, you know, just fly these things better and to see where there might be things I might not have picked up on my own where I could improve. And so, you know, that's been great feedback and I benefited from it. I've, I've really enjoyed doing it. Um, Additionally, you know, I'm also happy because I can be part of something that's really good for the whole community, which is to take this data, aggregate it, so nobody knows exactly who did what, but I think what's come out of this is we learned that we tend to uh, make a lot of the same um, mistakes or, or even if they're not mistakes to do some things that could be better and we tend to all do the same things or many of us do and therefore uh, providing this data to the community makes all of us better and uh, hopefully contributes to that safety record as going forward. Um, and as I mentioned, it's been fun to do. It's, it's the competitive spirit, even if you're just competing with yourself, uh, to always be better and, and to try and, um, you know, to fly these things better. Or sometimes we actually improve the software by commenting on things that may not be uh, evaluating us correctly. And it, it's been great fun to be a part of that. And, and what's nice about this is it's still a small group and everybody's listening and we can all contribute, you know, whether we're on the committee or not. There's, you know, the people are listening. Um, and, uh, you know, one hope and, and uh, thanks to David Miller, there's been conversations with the insurance carriers um, about um, potentially, you know, using this data in some way that would be beneficial to us. 
uh, charging us less and our premiums would be, you know, one, and also making it possible for those of us who are aging pilots to stay in the game longer because we can prove we're doing pretty well. So, um, you know, I'd say we stay tuned with that, but it seems like, uh, from what I understand, we're making real progress. Um, as mentioned here, this has already contributed to identifying uh, things we could do better, particularly in the aggregated data, and uh, to changes in our standard procedures um, and operating tips that, again, help make us all better. Um, and as an update, I understand we now have 78 people doing this, um, and uh, 18 of them uh, just since the convention time, and we have 5,000 flights worth of data. Uh, the more data, the better and the more we can use some of these modern analytical tools to better understand what we're doing and what we can do better. So I guess in summary, this has been great for me. It's not only for its value, you know, sort of face value, but also for the interaction with the members of the community that um, are participating in this. So I would, I would encourage everyone, if there are any questions or concerns, I'd be happy to talk to anybody who, who has them, because again, this has been such a good thing for me. I'd encourage everybody to do it. Thanks, Nick. Um, fantastic. I, I would uh, just echo a couple of things. I will show you a couple more charts here in a second, but um, if you were at the convention or if you've been paying attention in particular to the Safe to Land program, you'll know that um, we've got some really good improvements in our straight in approaches, uh, stability rates are very, very high. Uh, but what we learned from this data in the past year is that we need to expand that attention into our visual approaches that in particular are not straight in. So that you'll see here in a minute. Um, and the underwriters indeed are paying attention. You know, you can't have a group like ours with 900 jets that goes three and a half years without a major claim. Um, uh, that is not gaining their attention. And uh, tools like this that show that we're evaluating ourselves, I think uh, really helps uh, the cause. So um, let me just show you a couple of things of interest, uh, especially for those of you who are not totally familiar with what uh, the flight data analysis does. This is a dashboard. Um, for those of you that are in the program, when you log on to your account, there's a little hamburger uh, thing in the upper right-hand corner of the page. And when you click on it, you can uh, select from one of several places to go. This is the flight data monitoring page or flight data analysis. It's a, a dashboard and it has uh, flight summaries. You can select what date range you want to look at. This is the last few weeks of uh, the number of exceedances we have. And then we monitor against our SOPs how often we might be bumping against um, an SOP limit. And I'll show you some of that here. And then uh, specific parameters can be looked at with a, a, a pull down menu over here. So what that looks like when you blow them up into the different corners, we've got 5,200 flights uh, since the uh, uh, up to the convention and then another 1,200 flights just since the convention. You can see that our unstable uh, rate on uh, approaches under instrument uh, straight ends is only two and a half percent. That's better than the industry standard if you want to call it a standard, which is typically 3%. But on visuals, we're 4% unstable. And we spent some time talking about that during the convention with how to best set ourselves up for visual approaches that lend themselves to a stable final. Um, and then if you look at the specific exceedances, you can see again that presents itself. If you look here, these are all 5,200 flights and then just the 1,200 since the convention. You can see in the visual approaches how much more red there is than there was with uh, instruments. And that has to do with primarily flying patterns too tight, resulting in high sink rates close to the ground. So this is very helpful to us to help further refine our SOPs and our simulator training um, with respect to uh, to how we best fly these. So uh, individual flight parameters, we, we generally, this is 5,000 flights, and you can see when it comes to our touchdown distance, we've typically rated 1,000 feet, a nice spread, very rarely beyond, out of 5,000 flights, just a handful beyond 2,500 feet, and uh, just a handful in the, the short range. Same thing with uh, speeds uh, relative to VREF. This would be VREF. This would be VREF plus 15 and VREF minus 6. Um, so really tight on our performance there, which speaks to good stable approaches. And then this one is really important, how much runway is remaining when you have 70 knots on rollout because it gives an indication of how close you might have been to, to not getting it stopped. And you can see there's very, very few that are, you know, 
1,200 feet, 1,000 feet, which is still plenty to stop from 70 knots. So again, really good. And then here's one that uh, is a uh, at more of a heads up than a safety thing, of course, but something the FAA could call you on is being above 250 below 10,000 and a handful of those. So the, the system will flag you on that, just give you a uh, kind of a heads up that that happened on the flight and make you pay a little more attention to it the next time. Uh, at this point, I'm going to ask Kirk uh, Samuelson to say a few words. He has been involved with this uh, since the very beginning, and uh, and I'll have Kirk share with you an example of what comes to you as an individual in the post flight. Kirk, over to you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Charlie, and uh, and thank you for exposing your data <laughs> versus one of my <laughs> flights. So, uh, of course, of course, Charlie I got to pick a good one, though, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you, of course, Charlie picks one where he got a 99 on it. But uh, now this is where it really gets exciting and fun. Uh, Nick mentioned the competitive juices, and we're not competing against others. We're competing against ourselves. We want each flight to be a 99 or 100. And, and when it's not, you know, there's been a few where I picked up the phone, called Charlie, and we had a little discussion about it. was it the parameters or was it me? And but it's <laughs> it, it, it it's all good, it's all good. But uh, the the score uh, card that you get, Charlie says five minutes. I swear I get mine typically about three minutes after I land. As soon as I get shut down and do a, a few of my post flight things, check the oil, whatever, I look at my phone and there it is. And, of course, the first thing we all run a look at is that kind of highlighted in green on Charlie's is the score, the 99 that he got. Um, but there's there's a lot of uh, there other breakdown that you'll see that, that are parameters that we're constantly taking a look at. Are we measuring the right parameters? And I think we're just really, in my book, just kind of scratching the, the surface of this. Uh, we're, we're setting them up to, to align with our safe to land so that we're integrating uh, what we're doing, aligning with our SOPs, as Charlie mentioned a little earlier, and reinforce why they're, all those are, are critical uh, for, for safe flight. Uh, so you get a score for each one of those parameters. And again, there's, I don't know, Charlie, is there 100 different parameters we could be scoring on? Yeah, typically you could get close to that, Kirk. What we've tried to do is just, uh, at least as we get established, let's try to focus on the more important ones, but the parameters coming off the airplane would allow us to, to basically break this into tracking our SOPs, tracking the FARs, tracking the op operating limits of the airplane, and right. giving everybody a heads up when one of those is on the edge, right? Right. And then if you've got a particularly challenging flight or a flight, you know, maybe ATC kind of screwed with you. I had one of those up, up in actually Rhode Island in the weather where they, they took me through the, the final... And you go back and you can, you can, you know, open up that, um, you know, 3D and it'll walk you through the whole flight, both vertically and, and, and horizontally, and you can actually replay your whole flight. So that's really cool. And, and if, you know, if there's some discussion about what, you know, were you correct or was ATC correct, you've got some good data there. Um, and then there's just some very helpful overall things on this, on this uh, you know, your fuel burn, your, you know, stuff for your logbook, you know, your, your, your block time, your, your flight time. Uh, and one of the things I really like is if, you know, all of us, oh, shoot, how much fuel was left on my airplane? Well, it's right there for you. It's, it's in the report. So then, you know, the next flight when I'm calling up to order fuel, I know exactly how much fuel is still on the plane. And so, and, you know, we've talked about, can some of these parameters maybe feed your maintenance programs, you know, your, your uh, Sierra tracks or camp. And there's, there's a lot more things that we could be doing with this. So again, I think we're just kind of scratching the surface and Charlie's constantly looking at that and, and looking at ways we can make this even more useful. So, uh, but, but this is what makes it fun, you know, and, and I have to say there's a firmware update on my box. I'm, I was one of the first adopters. Uh, I looked up, Charlie, this, this March, it'll be three years. But uh, you would think after three years, uh, I'm not really paying attention to the report and it's the ex exact opposite. There's a fir firmware update being done on my box. And so the last 10 flights, I haven't had this report. And I can tell you, I miss it. I want the report. <laughs> I've been calling Charlie saying, when are they getting this damn firmware <laughs> squared away? Because you just, it becomes a way of how you fly. I just, without that, this report at the end of each flight, I feel like there's something missing in my safety routine. 
So no, I I think it's it's not just something fun at the beginning. It's something that becomes the way you fly. Charlie. Yeah. Th thanks, Kirk. And and I'm in the same boat because the firmware update on my box has just now been finished. So the last couple of flights, I've been able to use it again, but I did miss it as well. And uh, so this this is an, a couple of uh, clips from the email that you get. Kirk alluded to being able to dive deeper. If you have a question beyond what you see in the email, you can click on this virtual map that shows your flight and it'll take you into the website and you can look at your trajectories in 3D. You can see a simulated HUD kind of hit up display image of it and so forth. So it's very, very beneficial. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, there's a three-step process to get into the program and we'll, we'll we'll make sure we usher you through this for those of you who are interested it will give you some information on how to, to get into it but it's basically equip subscribe and fly in the equip area this is probably the the most challenging because each of us have different kinds of avionics you get the data off the airplane you have to have a slightly different set of equipment and based on that the costs are different um the cheapest way in is if you have an Aries 2 uh, recorder already on board, but that happens to be the slowest way to get your data back. So even though it's less, almost zero cost, it, it really does not respond as quickly as some of these other methods that require that you take and put a new box on board. If you have a Garmin, it's 1100 bucks or so for a Garmin AirSync box. And if you have a, a Collins, that same AirSync box has to be hardwired in. Uh, so it's about 4000 and then those downloads uh, become automatic. And again, uh, we can we can help you uh, through that process. Once you're equipped, then there's subscriptions. There's a subscription to get the data by a cell phone transmission that's in the box, get it off the airplane and get it to the analyst. And so you have a, a subscription at Four Flight Cloud Avoid that analyzes your data and sends you the email uh, on top of the subscription for the cell service to get the data off the airplane in the first place. And so those two are shown here. Uh, and then finally, you just go fly. Once you uh, you have those set up, then there's little pilot interaction in most cases. You just go fly, it automatically gets the data and sends you an email, which is really nice. Um, so if, if you want to jump in on this with us, we welcome that. Up. Obviously, we think this is going to be a key to um, a lot of future opportunities for the association. And if you just send an email to Liz at citationjetpilots.com and include your, your airplane type tail number and your avionics on board from there, we'll, we'll usher you through the process. So Liz, anybody have any questions real quick before we go, go to the next one? Um, there's been no questions in the chat. Okay, well, we'll wait towards the end then as, as things come. All right, so um, I'm gonna turn it over to Randy Broyles now to talk about our Gold Standard Safety Award. This has been in place for quite some time and I think there's a number of our members who think it's harder to actually accomplish uh, and meet the requirements than it is. So Randy, over to you. Yeah, thanks Charlie. Uh, good evening all. And uh, as Charlie said, opening up, uh, the Gold Standard Safety Award has been in place since 2018. Uh, currently, uh, last year, 2023, we had 70 member, members who were qualified. That's plateaued. We ramped up nicely the first three or four years, and more recently, it's plateaued. We're, we're frankly disappointed about that, and we, uh, we don't completely understand what the drivers are. But I'm going to cycle back to that question uh, before we move to the next topic. Uh, for those that don't know, flight safety pay whether you train with flight safety or not is not a, a factor, but they pay uh, your CJP member dues uh, for all gold standard members. So they introduced that a couple of years ago and uh, gold member uh, awardees have, have enjoyed that perk. Uh, increasingly underwriters are asking, uh, they're showing much more interest in gold standard and uh, I think that's going to continue to gain traction with the, the insurance market. And uh, those of us who are at or approaching 70, uh, I think that's also the, 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 the cases that I know of who folks who are continuing to fly after 70 are all uh, gold standard members. So uh, it can be a real help. Over the page there, Charlie. The, uh, 
uh, award, as you know, is uh, once a year uh, at our convention. And that's what drives our annual cycle from August through July. Uh, just to remind you on what the qualifying details are, a minimum of 100 hours PIC in uh, multi-engine turbine aircraft. Uh, we uh, also expect people to comply with the CJP standard operating practices. So you need to sign off on that. And then uh, there's uh, three ways, three, three uh, flying events that need to be checked off to, to earn the award. You need at least one 6158 in a part 142 simulator. Uh, in addition, it's the owner member's choice you can do a second 6158 over that 12 month period, either in a simulator or in the aircraft, or you can, uh, you can have six hours of training in, uh, in, in your airplane. So uh, you don't necessarily have to go back to the simulator twice a year. And uh, lastly, we, we want you to have at least one additional enrichment training. And, and let's look at that list, list of items. It's, it's long and it's by no means is exhaustive, but I'll just highlight a few that, that I think are among the most important ones. It's, it's uh, embracing our safe to land program. It's participating in the FOCA program that, uh, that Nick and Kirk talked about. Uh, you're going to hear more from Jonathan on the safe to land in just a moment. A new rating uh, would check that box. Uh, upset recovery is a big one. I, I went through that a uh, year before last in Mojave with flight research. And, and after, after being encouraged by good friends like, uh, like Kirk and, and Charlie, that this is something we all need to take on. And, and I learned a ton um, the annual convention is an easy one. Those of us who attend uh, the CJP convention, it's an easy one. So any of these things qualify. Uh, if there's any doubt, send us an, e an email and we'll get right back with you. Uh, but believe me, this is not an exhaustive list. I, I think the, uh, the, the process is simple. You, you, you complete all of this online and submit it online. I, I would close my remarks by telling you that initially I was a doubting Thomas. Uh, I had owned a citation, operated a citation for five years. And as I watched the gold standard award program being developed by people that I greatly respect, I started listening and I, but I was very much in the mind frame of, look, I'm staying current. I exceed uh, my FAA requirements. I, I, I do the annual 6158. All, it's always been in uh, a simulator with FSI, by the way. And uh, at the time, I was convinced that I just didn't have the time to, to dedicate another two or three years, three, two or three days a year to uh, additional training over and above what the FAA requires. I, I will tell you it's the best thing I've ever done. I've been a six-year... Uh, awardee, and I don't regret any of those. Um, when I contrast my 6158s today versus the way the first five of them went for me, uh, when I started flying a citation, uh, the 6158 event itself is very different. Uh, it, it felt more like a test. It was something you kind of sweated your way through. And I, I'll tell you, it's become a, a learning uh, experience instead I find that my skills are uh, sharper. I'm flying more precisely through the year. And, and uh, a term that uh, I'll give credit where credit's due that, that I heard Charlie say years ago, and it resonated with me in a huge way. He, he said, flying is a perishable skill. And, and when I explored that with him a little bit, he, he started talking about with the, 10,000 plus flying hours that he's accumulated in all kinds of, of turbine aircraft. Uh, if he lays off for a week or 10 days, he notices a change in his skill, his skill level. 
And I'm thinking, wow, I really need to, to wrap my head around that. If Charlie can say that, certainly it's happening to the rest of us. And so when I, uh, all of you have experienced this, if you've traveled for a while, if you've got a business conflict, if your airplane's hung up in the shop for a few weeks, you don't fly. And uh, when you get back in the, in the aircraft, you know exactly what it's like, getting your flow back, getting your scan back. And uh, the, the way I, I used to manage that was I just refused to take off in, in low weather. And I refused to fly into low weather uh, until I'd, I'd made a trip or two. But that said, it's uh, the, the, the twice a year training is huge for me. I'm, I'm a big proponent and I can't think of flying this airplane another way. So with that, um, I'm happy to entertain questions or Charlie, keep moving to Jonathan. Yeah, that sounds, that's a great testimonial, Randy. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, yeah, I think we'll, uh, we'll pick up some questions towards the end, start to accumulate those. Thanks so much. Um, and the third of our three initiatives here we want to introduce and reinforce, uh, I'll leave to Jonathan Bailey, who's spent a lot of time helping us with this. Um, safe to land. And over to you, Jonathan. Well, thanks, Charlie. And uh, Randy, I'll agree. Nine months is is my rust limit. Any longer than that, and I'm I'm all elbows in the sim. So uh, that's definitely true. It's a perishable skill. Um, and you know, when I first saw that the outline for our discussion here, by the way, let me back up and say welcome everybody. And I apologize that I didn't get to see uh, everyone in person at the convention this last year. I got sick at the last moment, and I figured it was probably not a good idea to turn it into a super spreader event. So. Uh, stayed at home, but I really did miss it. I, I love the convention and uh, you know all the excitement for the programs we get to share there. So um, the Safe to Land program, um, you know, we started out talking about the FOQA data here and I thought that's kind of weird when I saw the outline, why are we doing that first? But it really makes sense in a way, the, the Safe to Land program and, and Charlie, tell me, I'm, it looks like we're doing pretty well on time. So I'll maybe give a few minutes of background here or what do you think? Absolutely. Yeah, we're doing fine on time. We'll have probably a good 15 plus minutes for questions still. So Awesome. Awesome. So, um, you know, the whole safety committee was formed after a series of accidents. Um, you know, the people, I think Kirk Samuelson and, and several others got Charlie on board and said, what can we do to fly safer? We got, we got to do a better job of the owner pilots of citations. And, um, you know, the safety committee was formed. Uh, it became clear industry-wide that uh, runway excursions were really the, the biggest source of accidents. They weren't always balls of fire, but a lot of airplanes were getting ruined and uh, insurance has been going up steadily for quite a while now. And um, and we're also concerned about you know our ability to keep flying single pilot, especially past the age of, of 70. So, you know, some some big brains got together and, and came up with this idea of addressing the, the runway excursion problem. We figured if that if that could be dealt with, it would knock down a lot of the, the accidents and expenses that are that are happening. Um, this was all before I ever got involved. Um, the the presage group out of Canada uh aviation experts and uh behavioral researchers and this is the stuff that i love with this it's how our brains work how our brains think about think about flying and um they were engaged to do uh, a study with cjp pilots and by the way they had done this type of study and program with airlines in canada uh air canada uh we were working with one of their chief pilots um uh, uh, Bill uh, Bill Curtis, um, yep. Priyush Gandhi was the chief test pilot at Bombardier, and uh, a lot of airline experience, and um, and Marty Smith, who is a PhD behavioral researcher and and pilot as well. So these guys came down and uh, did a well before they came down. We did a study with the CJP members. It was a a long questionnaire online. Took about fifteen minutes to fill out. But with the information they got, uh, we had enough people respond so that it was statistically meaningful about how we fly, how we think about our flying, the types of operations we engage in. Um, crunched all that data through through Marty's you know proprietary software and kind of came up with a, a a good analysis of 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 who we are as a group of pilots, how we fly, 
and what we what we think is safe and then what are our blind spots you know what what, what do we not know uh so well about how we're flying and uh, a working group was assembled we spent three days in wichita in 2021 and um, i was invited to participate in that and and what came out of all of that it was you know days days of discussion and and talking about you know approach standards and faa standards but also psychology and thinking and looking at the data of of, of what cjp members do and i remember one of the most uh, striking numbers that that came out of the study with cjp operations is that 70 percent of our approaches are visual and charlie i noticed in the foca data you put up the number of visual approaches was 71 percent on that aggregated yeah. data so yeah. that seems to be holding pretty steady so um and and this is really important because we're all trained in the sim and and throughout our careers as pilots uh, how to do an instrument approach, which is a very structured sequence of events with airspeeds and altitudes and configurations. And we've all learned how to do that pretty well. We do it regularly in the sim, but that's not what we're doing every day in the airplanes. Uh, 70% of these approaches are visual. And that basically to me means you just make it up and go land somewhere. Um, sure, we're still following parameters and guidelines, but um, it's it's not a structured environment that we're, we're trained for. And um, that may or may not have something to do with the, the runway excursions that are, are industry-wide, but we wanted to ask, how can we do this better? So Charlie uh, has explained really well, better than I can, that you know most of the FAA guidance and safety uh, group guidance had a criteria where if you were flying instrument, you needed to be fully configured and on speed at a thousand feet above ground. And if it was visual conditions, you should be configured and stable at about 500 feet. And uh, the problem with this thinking, and this has been going on for decades, this is what we were all taught. So you had a goal at 1,000 feet to be fully configured on speed, and the limit was at the same place. The limit meaning that if you weren't in those conditions, you were supposed to do something about it, which is essentially go around. The problem with that is that we're all pilots, we're all humans, and we all know that a thousand feet is a is a long time. That's you know probably over you know minute and a half before you hit the ground. I can bleed off twenty knots. I can get my last bit of flaps in. I can I can do this very safely, and that's what everyone did. So we had a a, a guideline out there which is a goal and a limit co-located at the same place, and everyone just blew by it and did their own thing because they knew they could save the landing. And most of the time. That works just fine up until you have a Dale Earhart where they're doing 170 on short final and bounce three times down the runway and get wrapped up in a chain link fence. So, you know, that that brings up the next question is if we're going to ignore that guideline, then people are just making it up the rest of the way into the ground. And uh, when is enough is enough. You know, that the, there was no answer to that. People had to make it up. And that's where a lot of these these, I think, excursions have happened. Um, you know, and I've had a lot of chance to I'll, I'll talk about what the Safe to Land program is in a second. But the other problem with that, that I think that psychological scenario where we all have a guideline and we're all ignoring it is that it teaches us that it's OK to ignore rules. We've normalized uh, noncompliance is what the psychologists would say. And that's a really dangerous place to be, I think, in aviation, because who knows where else does that type of thinking bleed over into our operations? I just think it's it's a bad place to be mentally. So um, maybe you could flip over to the, the next slide now, the cue card. Um, so what, you know, and Charlie's explained this really well in a lot of the conventions, and we've shot videos and talked about all this. The whole key to the Safe to Land program is let's let's try to take our goals and separate them from a limit so that we've got a little bit of room in between to to get these things done if we're you know people are not going to be going around at a thousand feet if they're 15 knots fast so let's give them let's give them some time and space to get it within compliance and let's define what these parameters are what the limits of these things are and um and this works with how pilots brains really work and uh, th these are the types of details we worked out in the safe to land group with the presage people guiding us and we came up with these numbers, and these numbers weren't just pulled out of thin air. These numbers were really developed based on uh, the CJP members' feedback. Came up with basically a, a bottom line limit of two, 200 feet, which is very similar to an IFR minimum on an ILS. 
Um, and, you know, there's good, good reasoning behind that. Um, so we've got a, a thousand foot gate now, and we're going to try to have the airplane configured there. And uh, we've got a 500 foot stable gate which is airspeed, alignment, energy, that type of thing. But we've got down to 200 feet to fix it. And uh, that really aligns with what pilots were doing anyway. Uh, and that, that makes more sense. But what's different now is that at 200 feet, we've got hard limits. If these things aren't fixed, if they're not within tolerance, then you really need to go around. And um, in addition to that, we've introduced the, the idea of the touchdown point limit on the runway, so let's say everything's you know within parameters. You're going below 200 feet. Uh, it doesn't mean the job is done. What if you get a gust of wind? What if you're floating too long? A lot of the accidents that have happened are a result of contaminated runways. People not understanding that you know they needed three times as much landing distance as they thought they had, hadn't done the calculations, or just didn't understand the performance uh, criteria. So with the touchdown point limit, we've got a number now that says. If my wheels aren't on the ground by taxiway Z, you know, then I got to go around. I, I know I don't have enough room to stop. And that's that's been, a, I think, a, a huge leap forward in, in, in just, you know, knowing whether you're going to make it or not. So if, if we're if we're blowing past a thousand feet, that was our limit, our gate in the old world, the old model. We're just guessing the rest of the way on down. We're just guessing. So if you want to go into the next slide, we wanted to take the guesswork out of it. And this, this cue card, it's a two-sided cue card. We'll go to the back side in a second. If, it, if this is the first time you're seeing it, it's, it's kind of a lot to take in. But let's just go through it real quick. The, the top row across is the 1,000-foot configuration gate. And, you know, you, you call out at that point, 1,000 feet. Am I configured? Do I have my gear and flaps down? If the answer is yes, you're configured. If not, you repeat the offending parameter until it's... It's met gear, gear. And Neil Singer's got some great videos going through um, all of these scenarios. So you want to be configured at a thousand feet. And by the way, I do this on instrument approaches all the time. It's not hard. It looks like a lot when you first see this card, but you know, the, the thousand foot configure gate takes up two seconds of my time. And if I forgot the full flaps, I put them in, we're done. Going on down to 500 feet. And now at 500 feet, um, and, and I like to talk about the safe to land philosophy is you're flying down a funnel, you know, you're, you're, the parameters are getting tighter. You've got to be more closely within the specs, the further you get down. And if at any point you, you don't think you're going to be able to get there, you can go around. This is not saying you have to go down to 200 feet, but at 500 feet, we're looking to have things pretty well under control. And that means airspeed, energy, alignment, bank angle, engine power, those types of things. You want to get pretty well dialed in by that point. And if anything's out of spec at that time, you're going to keep repeating it until you uh, make the decision to either, uh, you know, at an IFR minimum, go around or go visual or uh, in visual conditions, it would be a 200 foot call. And if, if you're not there by 200 feet, you say limit, go around, you know, so you're, let's say I'm fast. I'm, I'm 20 knots too fast at 500 feet. So I'm going to start saying airspeed 200 airspeed 200 as i'm going down shit i can't get this thing to slow down sorry for my french there and um you know at 200 feet if i'm still too fast i'll just say limit go around but i know that i'm too fast i've got a parameter to meet and i know that my only action at that point is to go around and the same type of thinking ap uh, applies to the uh, the touchdown zones on the runway we've got a, a distance zone the tpl the touchdown point limit uh, we're shooting for, you know, between 500 and 1500 feet is our sort of green zone. But we know exactly at what point on that runway it, uh, we've got to get the wheels down. If we don't limit, go around. And the same thing applies to lateral. We know if the center line goes past our center post on the window or to the other side of the window going to the right, we're too close to the edge. We're going to go around at that point. And uh, back up one second, Charlie, if you would. The notes on the bottom of this uh, Q card, um, I really like these notes because they always surprise me. If you're going 10 knots too fast, you need 20% more runway to land. If you're only 10 feet high crossing the threshold, you're eating up another 200 feet of, of uh, runway. And floating and delayed braking takes up an extra 180 feet per second. That's huge. 
I actually like looking at that because it reminds me how serious this stuff is. You know, I, I often think, ah, 40 or 60 crossing the threshold. What's the difference? Well, there is a difference. So anyway, Charlie, thanks. Let me go on to the next page. This is the back of the uh, cue card on the left here. And these are basically the criteria we're looking for. You know, configuration is gear and flaps down, airspeed VREF minus five to plus 10. And, um, you know, this is one of those things we, we probably talked about this for an hour in the meetings. Well, why minus five? The FAA and flight safety won't let you go to minus five if you're on your check ride. But we wanted to build a system that was realistic, that people don't ignore. Again, you get back to the idea, if you have rules and people are ignoring them, then the rules are no good. So we know that if someone's three miles or three knots slow on an approach, they're not going to execute a go around, nor do we want them to. Executing a go around, and we talked about this a lot, it's not a zero risk event. It's a high risk event or, you know, one in 10 of the airline go arounds in the world have, you know, serious out of compliance, you know, factors. They bust in altitude. They don't turn at the right time. It, it is not a zero risk event. And the lower you get, the, the higher risk it is. So we're not trying to encourage people to go around unnecessarily. We just want them to know when when they need to do it. Uh, bank angle, 15 degrees, vertical speed, and so on. It's, it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory what the criteria are. And um, I think that's about it. You know, I did mention, again, you don't have to wait to 200 feet. If, if you don't think you're going to get it together by 200 feet, go ahead and go around and continue at 200 feet does not mean it is actually safe to land. You still have to get the plane down on, within the right distance on the runway and not be drifting too far to either side. Last um, thing that we came up with as part of this group, and it's, you know, I think this will always be a work in progress, but it's, it's in pretty good condition right now. It's on the right side of your screen, the safe to land told card. And this, uh, I think we handed out, uh, you know, hard copies of this at the convention. I don't know if we have a PDF up on the website, but I, that, or that that will happen soon. Yeah, and it's, in the, is, it's in the in-flight guide. So oh, that's right. It is in the in-flight guide. And um, this is really useful to fill out when you're in cruise. you got nothing else to do. You've got some time to kill. Go ahead and fill this out. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm lazy. I admit it. I don't like to fill out excess paperwork. I don't like to do things I don't have to do. But I've started doing this since we developed it, and um, it's improved my situa situational awareness on landing, and um, I think just my overall alertness on landing a lot more. You, you fill this out to calculate your uh, touchdown point limit, but it's also got some, some things in there that um, I never thought about before. The difference between the glide slope on the visual, the Pappy, the Vazzy versus the instrument approach. Well, a lot of times these are different. A lot of times you look up at minimums and you got three reds or three whites or excuse me, four reds or four whites in front of you. And uh, my wife's asking me, why are we too high or too low? She understands what that means. I said, well, the glide paths don't agree, but if it would be helpful to know that before you got there, right? So I found this card incredibly useful in, um, in preparing for my approaches and landings. Um, you're just, you know, just more on top of things. And I believe, Charlie, that ForeFlight is working on a way to automate that data, uh, correct? Yeah, they're going to give us a way to, to calculate the TPL for us so we don't have to go through the math based on a runway analysis tool that's in the ForeFlight if you're a subscriber. Great, great, yeah. Anyway, I'll stop here because I don't want to take up uh, time for questions later, but uh, it's really an exciting program in the sense that it makes things simpler but there's a lot of thinking behind it and I, I like things that make flying simpler and remove you know uncertainty i don't i don't like not knowing what to do and this has filled in a huge gap for me thanks jonathan this, that's great and you know the folks at flight safety sponsored a lot of the resources and provided a lot of the resources to do this program including uh, a four-hour session you can get at flight safety it's been challenging to get in the sim as you know um, but it's uh, to do this course, which is a third event qualifier for gold standard. Um, you go and uh, get two hours of classroom, two hours in the simulator. The sim is awesome. They have 11 scenarios that have uh, very insidious setups um, that are really realistic that stress your decision making against the safe to land cue card. Drifting, floating, turbulence, all kinds of things that get you to think about whether you should continue or go around. All of the centers except Tampa and Long Beach have this now. 
Uh, and as a matter of fact, they're going to put the two hour classroom piece on a video so you can do it like online. And then you just have to get the two hours in the simulator when you go there and you don't need a, um, an examiner, if you will, any instructor can teach this course and you'll find it really beneficial. Um, and I'll just uh, wrap up with, uh, since the SIM is important to us for both the gold standard and for safe to land, uh, we all know there's been challenges there for the safe to land, as I mentioned, they're going to make it uh, easier for you to get in there. You don't need an evaluator. It's a two hour deal. You can tack on or go in as a standalone tack onto your 6158. And they're doing some things to improve scheduling. None of these are going to be an immediate uh, fix, but it is starting to lighten up a little bit. Uh, they have curtailed the use of TBD by flight departments when they schedule. They were hoarding a bunch of slots, um, and they're not going to let people do that anymore. Also, Farm Bro is going to have a CJ3 plus M2 sim, which will uh, provide for all the EASA pilots, and they won't have to come and um and saturate Wichita anymore, so that'll help. And then uh, a lot of new instructors have been making it through the process. So uh, on top of all that, they're working with us to create a gold standard SIM training program, which will be catered to our specific needs. And it'll allow us as a group to help each other get scheduling priorities and scheduling flexibility. So we're working on those um, uh, and more to come. None of this will be immediate uh, and it's not a panacea, but it sure is addressing the issue. So with that, I'd like to uh, have Liz help us get into any questions folks have so that uh, we can cover those and make sure that we didn't miss anything that's of important to you. And uh, as I said, um, you can send Liz, Liz at citationjetpilots.com, uh, an email to get uh, further, you know, we can usher you through the process for any of these. So if you have any questions, um, if you either want to type it in the chat or just start talking, I'll spotlight you and you can ask any questions. Charlie, while we're waiting for that, you mind if I take a yeah, go for it, bro. Yep. Yeah. So just just to recap, folks, the uh, I mean, tremendous, tremendous resources that we have here for the FOCA program. Just remember that's anonymous data. So if there's any confusion, there was two pieces there. What Charlie showed you for his almost perfect flight uh was <laughs> that was his data, right? And so he's the only one who sees that. The other data, the aggregated data, that is uh, purely anonymous. And and Charlie, is there any way you can find out who was part of that if you wanted to? No, no, that right. is uh, on the other side of the firewall at ForeFlight. And they right. de-identify your tail number and, um, and the destination that you flew to before it goes into that dashboard. Right. Yeah, so that's important. So if you ever were wondering, you know, this is not Big Brother looking over your shoulder. This is not somebody... That's gonna tattle on you, whatever. This is uh, this is just the aggregated data because it really gives a good feeling for how our members. The more data we have, the more accuracy we have on how our members are doing overall, uh, and that kind of has, has led to the Safe to Land 2.0, where Charlie looked at that, looked at the data, and said, "Hey, you know what? Where is the areas that we can improve upon?" And so that that will help us focus more learning, more safety for everyone. Um, so that's the focal piece. So don't, I just want to reiterate. And I will, feel, uh, I'll, yeah. I will say too, that as it's matured, we've been learning some things at a more detailed level. And in, in another month or so, we're going to have a, another call like this that will focus on the current users. Anyone will be obviously uh, welcome to attend, but we'll go deeper into changes we're making to it and uh, things that'll make it easier for you to be a user um, and uh, look for that call here in another month or so. Okay, great. Um, the gold standard, again, this this is absolutely tremendous. Uh, there's a great quote that reminds me of from Henry, Henry Ford, and it says, anyone who stops learning is old, whether they're at 20 or 80. Anyone who keeps learning stays young. The more I live, the more I learn. The more I learn, the more I realize, the less I know. So to me, that gold standard is just a, a tremendous way, like Jonathan was saying, to kind of keep your, hone your skills, keep them sharp, and just continuing to learn. And what better way to do that than uh, than what we've laid out here today? Uh, and then finally, the safe to land. Again, safe to land is going to save lives, no doubt about it. Um, the touchdown point limit, all of the things that we've done here, it may take an extra few seconds, but that preparation beforehand is certainly going to save lives. And I think we've seen that over the last three years just with uh, with our safety record. So uh, awesome, awesome uh, information from everybody. Charlie, thank you. And thanks to everybody.
there is a couple of questions here, I think, that came up. Liz, if you want to grab them. Yeah, so Grant uh, was asking, uh, he gets the Cloud Ahoy data in via upload of KML from the four flight track log. Is there something better? And then can he get an overall flight score instead of just scoring on precision approaches? Uh, so, uh, yeah, Grant, the system we're showing here, uh, just so I make sure I understand the question, you're taking a log off of your current four flight um, file at the end of your 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 flight and you're getting data out of that. Is that what you're doing? You can go ahead and unmute him if you would, Liz. Yeah, I think, well, Grant still has himself muted, so I'm, I'm assuming. Okay. Uh, is that better now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, um, when I first got the Cloud Ahoy software up at the CJP conference or down in Nashville, uh, the gentleman told me to take my track log out of uh, out of ForeFlight and upload the KML from that, and I could just upload that into the uh, program, and that's what I did, have been doing. I see, and okay. That, and, and because I have the flight stream 510, it seems to have a lot of data there. You know, it's got okay. the majority of the data. Uh, I came back from uh, uh, New Orleans today and my flight stream 510 didn't work, so I didn't get all of the data. But so I, you know, half of my flights come into my own airport. And so there are non precision approaches, so I don't get a score for those. And, however, you know, I still want to maintain a, you know, a decent final approach speed. And, you know, I'm visual and I got a VASI here. So I should be able to do those things. But I don't, I would like to score according to the SOPs you guys put together, because I yeah. like my total score every time, you know, cause I, I have, I've, I, I taxied 32, 32 knots one time and then I got a red flag. So I'm like, Oh, I guess I better not taxi that fast. <laughs> so, so. Um, so I'm not, I, I am familiar with uploading the KML, but I'm not familiar with getting it out of the flight stream like you are. So I don't, I can't tell you directly which parameters are helpful that you're getting and which might be missing. But what we found typically, and which is why we recommend it going to the air sync is we get all of the AHERS and ADC data. We get a bunch of configuration parameter data, a lot of things that uh, lesser systems aren't providing us. So it really enhances um, the output. Um, what we could do, Grant, what we could offer is to get offline and, and maybe do a side-by-side -side of, of one of your KML files with uh, sure. an AirSync output and see what you might be either able to do. If if it's successful, we could offer what you're doing to others. What airplane are you flying, just out of curiosity? Mustang number 13. Okay. Yeah. So um, you could, if that's working for you, that's great. We'll take a look at what you might be missing and then we'll compare that to the AirSync because you could easily just uh, throw an air sync in there. And okay. and uh, the other thing is to make sure that your data is flowing into the CJP aggregated pool, uh, that you're truly part of our our uh, cohort, if you will. So, Okay. Yeah, I think is I that, am. Okay. So have you been getting our scoring system in your and getting the email at the end of your flights? Uh, yeah, yes. After I submit the data, I get an email. Okay. All right. Okay. So you're doing some stuff manually that you wouldn't have to if you're on the air sync. So it would do it automatic. Okay, yeah. But that's Happy not very hard. Send, Yeah, send Liz an email and we'll get with you offline and we'll make a comparison side by side and see if we can optimize for you. Yeah, I don't know how I would send you the my 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 comparison file, but I'll try to figure something out. Uh, or I can uh, send you an I, we can get flight. the folks at Cloud, we can get the folks at Cloud Avoid to help us with that. I wouldn't we wouldn't do that ourselves. Yeah, okay. I love that program. It's I think that's very helpful for just telling me how I'm doing relatively, you know, and uh, I think that's a great idea. I love Cloud Ahoy. Good deal. Thank you. Yeah, thank Appreciate you. the testimonial. I see Roger's got his hand up too. Hey, it's Roger Frayden. Hey, Charlie and Kirk and Jonathan. Uh, you guys are doing a superb job. I just want to personally thank you for all the hard work you're putting into making us all better and safer pilots. I, I had a suggestion, um, like many of CJP members, I've had the privilege of flying with Mossy. And, and before we lost him, he actually had put together a safe to land program in the aircraft, which I did with him. I found it very valuable. And I wonder if that's something the safety committee would consider offering as an alternative 
train up some instructors we have high confidence in and allow them to offer in-aircraft in safe to land uh, for those who want to take advantage of it. Yeah, so uh, thanks for that input. And we we really um, sorry for the fact that we've lost a huge asset and a great friend. Um, that was just shocking to all of us. And he was such a great guy to have with us at the convention. And the fact that he picked up on what we're doing and is is uh, helping people with the in-airplane training was, was tremendous. Um, there's a couple of things uh, we can do there. I liked your idea of um, making sure that we help a few instructors that are, in fact, um, teaching this to be standardized to the intent of our SOP. Um, and I think that's something we definitely could go could, could go do. Um, I would encur encourage you, though, too, to continue to, to consider the simulator. The, the scenarios that they give you in the simulator are not uh, creatable in, in an airplane. Uh, they're insidious. They have atmospheric disturbances. They're all free uh, programmed and they put you in, in and you might be able to create one or two of them in the airplane, but not very well. And so um, you will get much more out of a, a two hour session in the simulator than you can in the airplane. But I don't want to downplay the airplane too much because getting to use it in the airplane, we're actually making the calls and thinking about what the the techniques are asking of you is also extremely valuable. So I, I do like your your um, your recommendation there. Uh, Grant was asking if there's any plan to install safe to land at SimCom. He's been with SimCom four times and flight safety more than ten, and he believes they are both great training. Um, we have an agreement with flight safety that um, they because they put so many resources into creating. Uh, the program, validating it, and uh, and then writing up the court's work that um, we have given them um, the um, the keys to the castle, if you will, for provide being the provider of choice, and the fact that they're paying everybody's gold uh, CJP membership for being gold standard. Um, that's not to say that the folks at Simcom couldn't uh, teach this. Materials are are available, but um, they would they wouldn't have the same kind of pre-programmed simulator scenarios that flight safety has. They'd have to create those on their own from the from their own resources, which is fine if they want to do that. Uh, we just have been deferring to flight safety for all that they have contributed to us. Okay, got it. Thank you. You bet. And I, 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 I see where you're going with having options. That makes a lot of sense. And I will say we've talked to some other providers uh, as well about helping with the training it's it's been a, a huge lift that's taken a lot longer than anyone had thought it would i mean several you know probably two two plus years now but flight safety is is really finally up to speed the, the programming turned out to be a big challenge uh, different sims have different background software but we're really optimistic that after a, a bit of a delay that they should be able to deliver in fact i reached out to them today about just doing a standalone uh uh, you know, safe to land module not tied to my my 6158 because that was too hard to schedule. So I said, heck, I'll just go do it alone. I'll I'll go do it in a different airplane. I don't care. You know, it's yeah. just it's just simple controls. I don't need to know how to program the FMS to go do it. So that's a really good point. You can do uh, if you're flying a Mustang, you can do it in a Mustang sim, or you can do it in a CJ uh, an M2 sim for that matter, because the FMS is just not important for for that training. So. Can I ask one question? If you could whisper that in their ear a couple of times, that would help. Sure. In flight safety's ear, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Could I, uh, I, somebody was trying to ask a question. Yeah, Richard Ossoff. Um, is flight safety offering, uh, have they done the programming for the entire fleet? I mean, it meant you mentioned, or the, the slides mentioned that all but two training centers um, but are the other training centers offering the, the ones that are not excluded? Are the other training centers offering the training for, for example, the legacy aircraft? I, I believe there's a, uh, what is it that, uh, was it San Antonio, Randy, that uh, Endra was using? That legacy airplane is supported. Um, again, I would say that what you can do if you're in a legacy aircraft is, is take like a CJ3 sim and use that. Again, you don't need the avionics. You need an airplane that handles close and performance is, is good enough to get the uh to get the benefit of your your reaction to uh to the scenarios and the instabilities they give you. 
but there are some legacies that that uh, have been supported here. I just don't um, think that they're they're broad in all of the different centers yet, and they're moving out of San Antonio. So, does anybody else have experience with that, Jonathan, or anybody? I I think they were moving one to Houston. Is that the citation five? I'm I'm not expert in the legacies, but I do believe there's one uh, available at least. And I think there's one going to Atlanta as well. I want to say um, it's a citation two or a five. Yeah, the basic five fifty that's coming to Atlanta to replace the one that's here. Yeah, um, and it's supposed to be a better, uh, more. Uh, representative version and more reliable version that's going to Atlanta uh, than the one that's there is what they tell me. Being more reliable shouldn't be too difficult. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and chances are the one they're moving, if it's an upgrade, probably has 1990s vintage avionics uh, as well mm. as, a, as an improvement. <laughs> yeah, they're putting the GTNs, trying to get GTNs in the legacies as a minimum too. I think they've abandoned that, actually. We don't have to get into that here, but I think they abandoned that, with, uh, at least some of them. But in any case, the idea of going in a different airframe um, just to get basically the procedural stuff makes good sense. <laughs> yeah, I think just pick one that's close to your performance. I mean, all of the citations have about the same, you know, ref speeds, uh, Mustang being notably slower. Um, and, uh, you know, just uh, look at, a, I, I think a, a three is probably the most common in terms of similarity to all of them, if you wanted to jump in one of those, that would be very, very um, close to what you need, I think. Good suggestion. Thank you. All right. Blake, maybe I'll hand it back to you. Sure can. Thank you, Charlie. And thank you to everybody that uh, spent the time with us this afternoon. Uh, I would really appreciate if you could take just a couple of minutes to knock out an email or a message to us about what you thought of the time we spent together this afternoon and early evening for some of us to give us an idea about how we might improve on this format for the future so that we make sure it's valuable, that you get the value that you really need out of it for spending your time with us. Um, we're always looking for ways to improve, um, whether it's uh, more detailed slides or maybe in some cases getting you some kind of um, PDF format or a PowerPoint in advance, if that would be helpful. Uh, it would be um, help, a great asset for us to know that we're making the impact that we'd like to and how we might uh, make sure that we continue to get better in the future. Either uh, an email to Rob or, uh, or Liz, or Liz, were you going to send um, a, a brief survey to the participants afterwards? Yes, sir, I was gonna send a survey. Great, so if you could just knock one of those out, uh, if. I'm sure there'll be areas for free form uh, feedback. That would be really uh, great. And uh, also if you can think of ways to help us gross up the attendees so that people understand the resource that is here, this will be available. We recorded it tonight, so it'll be available for the rest of our membership to take a look at through the website at some point, probably be a communication about it. But uh, again, to wrap it up, uh, thank you. Rob, do you have any closing comments? Just again, I echo those sentiments and thank you to, to everyone who was on. Thanks for your time. Super important. And thanks for our entire team here that, that provided the information. All right. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Night. Talk to bye -bye. you soon. Bye-bye. Fly safe.